Giorgia Meloni has been sworn in as Italy's first far-right prime minister since World War II. The first female leader will head a cabinet with differing views on Ukraine and the European Union. So what's next for Italy and its approach to the world? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the show. I'm Sami Zaydan. Giorgia Maloney will lead Italy's most right-wing administration since the fascist era of Benito Mussolini. Her Nationalist Brothers of Italy party won last month's election, along with two others, Matteo Salvini's far-right league and the controversial former Prime Minister Silvio Berlusconi Forza Italia were in the winning camp too. Social conservatism, as well as anti-immigration and Eurosceptic rhetoric, all part of Maloney's political appeal. She's also voiced anger about Italy's struggling economy. But she's pledging support for Ukraine, a stance different from her Russia-friendly allies Salvini and Berlusconi. We'll get to our panel shortly, but first, Cara Legg has this report. I am Georgia, I am a woman, I am a mother, I am Italian, I am Christian. These words at a 2019 rally flanked by former Prime Minister Silvio Berlusconi and right-wing leader Matteo Salvini have come to define the rise of Georgia Maloney. Italy's first female Prime Minister heads the Nationalist Brothers of Italy party, which has its roots in a post-World War II movement that drew in fascist sympathizers and officials. Meloni sees herself as a defender of Italy's traditional Christian values. Si a la familia natural, no a los lobby. Yes to the natural family, no to the LGBT lobby, yes to sexual identity, no to gender ideology, no to Islamist violence, yes to secure borders, no to mass migration, no to big international finance, no to the bureaucrats of Brussels. She takes office at a difficult moment for Italy, facing an economic recession and soaring energy bills. But she's toned down some of her anti-EU rhetoric. The new finance minister is Giancarlo Giorgetti, who was part of the previous unity government and is considered a moderate. The foreign minister is Antonio Tajani, a pro-Europe politician who once headed the European Parliament. And the immigration portfolio went to a technocrat, not the hardliner Matteo Salvini, who became Minister of Infrastructure. One of Maloney's biggest challenges is Italy's Ukraine policy. Leaked audio messages suggest former Prime Minister and ally Silvio Berlusconi bragging about his friendship with Vladimir Putin and appearing to justify Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Putin was supposed to enter Ukraine and reach Kiev in one week, replace the government with a new one chosen by the Russians with a group of wise people. Meloni has consistently backed Ukraine. She responded to the leak by insisting Italy is a crucial part of Europe and the Atlantic alliance. But doubts linger. So the question for Europe will be, is Italy going to go wobbly? Will Italy remain a staunch NATO ally? Will Italy continue the Draghi policy of supporting Ukraine against the Russian invasion? Maloney says yes, her deputies are wobbly. Supporters say Maloney's coalition can help Italy's struggling economy. Critics fear it's shifting Europe's geopolitics further to the right. Cara Legg for Inside Story. All right, let's bring our guests into the show. They're all joining us from Italy in Rome. Valerie Fargen, Associate Professor of Political Science at the University of Florence and founder of Espanet Italy, a network for European social policy analysis. In Florence, Alberto Tonini, a Professor of Political Science and Associate Professor of International History and Energy Politics at the University of Florence. And in Milan, Teresa Fallon, a senior fellow at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs and a former member of the Strategic Advisors Group to NATO. A warm welcome to you all. If I could start with Valerie. So this is the first far-right government since Mussolini, Valerie. How much of a historic shift is taking place in Italian politics? Okay. Well, uh, I guess that 
a lot of people are sort of very worried about what's happening right now in Italy. Uh, my position is, and a lot of people are also happy because for the first time we have a woman, uh, I will say that I'm not that excited about having a woman prime minister because uh, it is true that this is the first time, but usually women get to very high positions when they're extremely conservative, you know, and it doesn't, you just think of Thatcher, think of Angela Merkel, think of uh, Marine Le Pen. So usually women get to top positions, but they don't really uh, undermine uh, male societal dominance in economic, political and social terms. Uh, and in this case in particular, we've got a woman uh, coming uh, uh, for the first time as prime minister in our country, but her approach and her vision and her ideology is extremely right wing. So I'm not that, to be honest, I'm not that happy with what is happening. Uh, but at the same time... Uh, so you don't think there'll be a, a massive sort of a, shift? Not, uh, there will be a shift, especially when it comes to discourse, when mm -hmm. it comes to the narrative that the government will be putting through. But the room for manoeuvre is not that much. All right. You know, that... we need the money mm -hmm. from Brussels. All right, we we'll, get, the in, we'll get into the national... money. They always say follow the money and we will. But let me uh, pick up with yes. Alberto on a point that you mentioned. So, Alberto, how do you think the political establishment is going to receive a female prime minister, first of all? Well, it's very, very challenging because uh, even her allies Mr. Berlusconi and Mr. Salvini seems to wait for her mistakes. So it's really a very uncomfortable position for Georgia Meloni. And uh, I, I think she must be very, very smart and clever to resist not her political opponents, but her political allies, because they were not so happy uh, to be uh, in the position to uh, agree to the uh, nominee of uh, Giorgia Meloni as prime minister. So I think that uh, we are going to have a switch, as uh, Valerie mentioned before, but not so, so much because, in fact, the space for maneuver is not so uh, large. And so I think we are going to have uh, some restriction in the uh, field of civil rights, some uh, probably uh, difference in this uh, sense, because uh, uh, both Georgia Meloni, but also the other uh, members of her government clearly state uh, that they are not in favor of any a new opening to civil rights and any new opening to uh, a mass migration or even minus migration. And so this could be, uh, this could make a difference with the previous government. All right, a lot to break down there. Perhaps we should start, Teresa, on policy towards the EU, the balance of power within the EU. Is that going to change now that we've got another government that's from the far right in the heart of the EU now. I mean, it's not just Hungary and Poland, right? How is the balance of power going to shape up between the far right and the non far right within the EU, if we can break it down that way? Of course, Orban reached out to Maloney after she won and congratulated her. And he feels that having three countries, he's welcoming them. But it's unlikely that she will find a lot of things to align herself with Orban. She might be closer to Poland because of her political agenda. But nevertheless, out of all 27 EU member states, it's scheduled to receive the, the bulk of the post-COVID-19 recovery fund from the EU, which would be 200 billion euro. And she cannot uh, sacrifice that. So I expect for her to move more towards the center and uh, she will have to keep the EU happy. She, her recent statements are pro-NATO, pro-EU, and anti-immigration. So I think that uh, as long as she colors within the lines of the EU rules and regulations and can guarantee that this money will be dispersed to the EU, uh, to Italy, uh, she will have a fighting chance. We should also keep in mind that this is gonna be one tough winter for the Italians. Energy prices are extremely high uh, with the war in Ukraine. Also 
you know, the post COVID-19 economic landscape in Italy has, is very troublesome. And even before COVID, they had difficulties. So I think that her main agenda really should be to focus on the economy. Now she is following in the footsteps of Draghi, who is known as a technocrat. The public really liked him. They felt he was a safe pair of hands as a former head of the European, uh, of the ECB, the bank, the European Central Bank. And so they were almost very sad to see him go. It was because of uh, political machinations. So she will have to really perform well. And if she follows maybe his policy, she might have a fighting chance. Many, I'm here in Milan now, and not many people uh, expect her to last longer than spring. So she has a tough road ahead of her. All right. So I think all three guests are kind of saying the same thing on the point of maneuverability. The scope is limited because you've got to look at who's giving you the money. But I'm wondering, Valerie, looking at it from the perspective of EU integration, that process, will her government make a difference in the speed, the tone of European integration now within the EU? Yes, I, I think it does make a big difference moving from Draghi to Meloni. Uh, Draghi was definitely, I mean, managed for the first time, perhaps the first time in history to put Italy really in a central position in the integration process. And I cannot expect Meloni to be able to do the same. Uh, just remember, I mean, how important Draghi was when he said whatever it takes. Now, can Meloni say something similar? I don't think. So for Italy, this is not a wonderful thing, what has happened. Mm. But I would like uh, our audience to remember that, in fact, uh, she has only like uh, I can 50 see percent Teresa of... wants to come in, but let, I'll let you finish the thought. Go ahead, Valerie, then I'll, I'll bring in uh, Teresa again. Yeah. No, what I wanted to say is that um, she's only, we're always considering that she's got 26% of the people that voted. But the fact is that if we take into consideration uh, the total number of voters, then we see that the major party is the party of the ones that did not go to vote, 16 million people. And she's only got 7 million people voting for her, which means she knows very well that a lot of people in Italy are not that happy about the result. It's basically uh, the, our electoral law that made it possible. So she knows that she's got like only 15 percent of support if we're looking at the total number of people that were entitled to vote. She knows that very well. So she's a tough woman. She's going to work hard. I'm sure about that. Uh, and but she does know that she can't do whatever she wishes. And I think that it's very clear uh, what she decided when it comes to immigration and the responsibilities she handed out to, uh, to Salvini. We know very well he didn't get the Minister of Home Affairs, which is the thing that he kept saying, I want that, I want that, I want that, but he didn't get it. It's just a top official that got right. the responsibility right. for Home Affairs. Okay. And also for the Navy, Coastal, the Sea, she invented a new ministry to make sure that he wouldn't be responsible for the Navy. So we're thinking about the Coastal Guard and what's going to happen with immigration. Nevertheless, I think that there will be symbolic shifts since they can't do much with, in terms of money, they will definitely try to introduce some symbolic policies. All right, you, you mentioned a lot there, Valerie, electorate. which we'll try and pick up on. Let me bring Theresa in and ask the question from this perspective. How will Brussels deal with Italy now under its first far-right government since World War II? You know, we've got two prominent figures, Meloni, Salvini, have both made comments seen as supportive of the Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban in his tussle with Brussels over the rule of law, democracy, corruption allegations, and so on and so forth. Is that going to impact the way Brussels now looks at Italy? I'm having a little difficulty hearing you, but just to paraphrase what I think you asked was about how Brussels will respond. We've already seen... Uh, German Chancellor Schultz re reached out to Maloney saying that, you know, there were democracies, there are changes of leadership, and we're willing to work whoever with whoever is elected. I think there's also a beauty contest going on here because we see that uh, President Macron of France uh, has a, a meeting uh, this weekend with the Pope and with the President of Italy. And he has said that if protocol allows, he would like to meet with her on Monday. So that is of great interest to me because He's almost racing to get to Italy first because France and Germany 
traditional uh, Franco-German engine of the EU is having a rough patch right now. And I think that the fact that, the Macron, that Macron is reaching out to Maloney means that he might see some possibility to uh, build support with her in order to maybe get what he wants out of Germany. So there's been a lot of uh, difficult relations within the EU EU recently. Draghi, Macron, and Scholz, uh, maybe you recall the famous or infamous train ride to Kiev, and they were all kind of squabbling about who had the better train car. So I think that the fact that Macron is reaching out to Maloney now shows that perhaps he wants to have good relations with her and, and thinks he can get more done if she's on board with his agenda as mm. well. Oh. So I think uh, there might be some intra-EU competition, but they understand, you know, Italy is the third biggest economy inside the EU and, you know, the top three. So they really do need to cooperate with Italy at this point. All right. Alberto, since we're talking about the train ride to Kiev at this point, what do you think about Italy's policy towards the Ukraine war? It, will that change? It's got two prominent figures, one of uh, whom, well, he's not in the cabinet, but Berlusconi, who was on tape boasting about how he exchanges vodka and wine with Putin. And Salvini's on the record as saying, hey, you know, we need to roll back the Western sanctions. Yeah, I think that the Italian position in the Ukraine uh, war is the field, the, the dimension that is going to change very, very little. Because Georgia uh, Meloni says more than once that Italy is not going to change his pro-Atlantic stand and his NATO membership, of course. So I think that in this dimension, Italian position will remain absolutely the same. And I would like also to add a few uh, comments on the uh, possible um, policy of the other European leaders, uh, because I think that from Brussels and the other European governments, there is no intention and there is no interest in pushing Meloni in a corner. In this moment, what they can do is to open a credit to Giorgia Meloni to avoid that she can uh, go closer and closer to Hungary and the Polish government, what she is not going to do at the moment. And so she has a weak position in the European context. And so I think that the, the other uh, European governments, France, uh, Germany, and the others are not uh, interested in uh, pushing her towards uh, uh, the Polish or the Hungarian government. Mm. All right, I can see there Valerie wants to say something. Go ahead. Yes, I just want to add something. That um, it is true that I don't think that uh, the government will change position with respect to Ukraine, but I am aware of the fact that uh, poorer people in our country are not that enthusiastic about the war. And they get less and less enthusiastic the more they have to pay when it comes to their electric bill. Mm. So the, the government will have to cash out a lot of money if it wants to keep people calm. Because really, across the country, there is an, a, a, a rising sentiment in terms of, you know, the argument is we want peace. Yes, but how do you get peace? How do you get? Obviously, everyone wants peace. But the point is, uh, are we going to then ask the Ukrainians to surrender? And a lot of people are not that interested. They're right. worried about their gas bill. And I'm very sorry about that. But that's the truth. The OK, truth, I want to maybe shift gears a little bit because you mentioned immigration policy. Um, how likely is it that we see Maloney's plan of a naval blockade of Libya actually emerge, um, Valerie, given, you know, the sort of realities that you've been talking about and the division of ministries. Yeah, uh, it, that's what I was saying. Meloni invented this new ministry of southern Italy and the sea and responsibility for the protection of the our coasts uh, is being handed over to a new ministry. Not, it's not under Salvini's responsibility. So that's a clear attempt by Meloni to try and keep Salvini calm. And I would like us to remember that uh, the vote for Salvini went from five millions to two and a half. So he's a loser in the current uh, uh, elections. And so is Berlusconi a loser. The only winner in the center-right camp is Meloni. And she's actually uh, taken votes, not from other parts, from the center-left. She's taken votes from 
Salvini and from Berlusconi. So she knows that she's in a strong position compared to Salvini mm. and Berlusconi. And we have seen how she's acted over the last uh, right. days and the way she has been behaving. And Salvini is not on the, let's say, he is sort of, for the first time, we don't see him all the time, you know, on the front pages. He's trying to keep back, uh, I guess, because he realizes that he's also in difficulty inside his own party. Right, right. But I don't know, because the problem is that they might come up with some crazy idea just to keep their electorate calm. All right, on, on that point, what practical changes should we expect then, Teresa, when it comes to immigration policy under this coalition government? No, well, that's a really good question. I think that remains to be seen. I think that this is always a popular issue, especially in Italy, especially with her party. And I would agree with the previous speaker that there has been a redistribution of votes within the right wing. So it's not that she's taking votes from the other parties. It's just a redistribution of votes. So I think that uh, as long as it kind of fits with EU policies, EU policy is pretty clear about immigration. So mm. this might help her get elected, but the reality might be very different on the ground. And uh, I think the number one thing for her is the economy and uh, the rhetoric you know, you say certain things to get elected, right. but then how you the reality of actually doing it is different. different. Yeah. Listen, uh, since we're talking about the economy, and that kind of takes us to divisions within this coalition, maybe we should just take a, a look at some of the major economic challenges that are facing Georgia Maloney. Inflation has hit 8.9% in September. That's the highest in nearly 37 years. And that's partly due to the energy crisis facing Europe, which I'm sure we're all aware of. Italy imported 95% of its gas before the Ukraine war, with 40% coming from Russia. That's obviously dropped now. Now it's around 10%. Then the, there's the colossal debt of more than $2.5 trillion. That's around 150% of Italy's GDP. And there's the relationship with the EU we've been talking about. Italy has been allocated nearly $200 billion in EU grants and loans as part of the post-pandemic recovery fund. But this depends on reforms that must be implemented by 2026. And Alberto, when it comes to some of these issues, there are real divisions within this coalition government, right? It's not only on the issue of whether you support Ukraine, as Maloney does, or you're more Putin-friendly, as... Salvini um, uh, and Berlusconi are, are painted. It's not only on the issue of where you stand vis-a-vis -vis Brussels fighting it out with um, Hungary. It's, it's on very economic issues. I mean, Maloney is seen as fiscally conservative. Salvini is a populist spender, right? Yeah, absolutely right. And this is really the uh, more difficult uh, field uh, for the for the new government because Giorgia Meloni will be judged by her voters according to the uh, economics performance of the next uh, six or one year. And mm -hmm. so she is strongly in need uh, to have uh, good results in uh, economics, but uh, she is not an expert of economics. She has very little experience uh, in this field. And also the people closer to Giorgio Meloni are not so good in economics uh, and economic affairs, economic management. And so this is really a, a clear danger for her. Do you think the government uh, she... will last? Do you think, Alberto, or is the coalition going to collapse? No, I don't think so for the moment. Uh, but I think that they, they need to be very, very cautious and very uh, focused on this point, economics, more than other uh, um, topics, because on this point, the uh, voters and the public opinion will be very, very sensitive. All right. Well, I'm afraid we are out of time. I know we uh, would like to continue, but another show, another time. For now, let's thank our guests, Valerie Fargen, Alberto Tonini, and Teresa Fallon. And thank you, too, for watching. You can see the show again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, head over to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. 
You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle there is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Sammy Zaydan, and the whole team here. For now, it's goodbye.